thank the Lord once again for being in his house and most of all for his salvation that he's brought to you and I through his son Jesus Christ and just like to thank him for allowing us to be in his house once again and We're getting ready to come up on the Easter season uh, this month coming up. And, you know, we've got to understand in our hearts that everything that Easter means <clears throat> to us is salvation that God has brought to... I can if you want to turn it on. I'm pretty loud in mouth when I want to be. <laughs> Nobody amen that one. Make it feel bad. If you have your Bibles and you turn with us to the book of Luke, now, Jesus in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke has been baptized. And he's been up in the wilderness, and the Bible says he was up in the wilderness for 40 days. And he was without food, and he wasn't hungered. And the, and the devil came and tempted him. And the Bible says that when that time was done, we'll start in verse 13. It says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now I want you to understand that there is none of us this morning... That, that is above being tempted by Satan. I want you to understand this morning, the thing about it is, this is, in Satan's eyes, this is not anything to do with you and me. This is how he can get back at God. For losing, the, the Bible says that he was the cherub that covered. He covered the throne of God. He was the most highest angel created. And he led worship. But when God created you and I in His image and His likeness to have a special relationship with Him, to be His precious is the apple of His eye, Satan became jealous of that fact. And the Bible says that when they had been created and they were in the garden and everything was going all right, the Bible says there came a day and the serpent came, which was Satan, uh, had took over uh, that particular animal in that garden and it came and he started tempting Eve. And the reason he done that was not that he could get you on his side, but that he could destroy you. Now listen, Jesus said about the devil, he said, the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life. Now I want you to understand, the devil's not your friend this morning. Uh, the voices in your head, they are telling you to do the evil things and things that are contrary to God. That's not God. That's not your friend telling you to do that. That is your enemy this morning trying to lead you down the path to destruction. And the Bible says, Jesus doing the talking said that He would deceive the very elect if it were possible. Listen, we are at odds with the world. We are at odds with the flesh. We are at odds with the devil. And I want you to know that we are in a war today. We are in the war and the battle for our life. And I want you to know if we don't trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for our salvation, Him alone for our uh, food, for our water, for our nourishment, for our understanding, if we don't trust in Him alone, we're going to be deceived because I want you to know we are so easily deceived this morning. The Bible says that when Satan left the tent, he said, departed for a season... Verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and, went out, and there went out a fame of Him through all the region round about. Now how, how is it that Jesus went out in the power of the Spirit into Galilee? He had spent 40 days fasting, and He had spent 40 days with God, in the presence of God. There's no time that you can spend with God where you'll not come out on the other end a little bit better. There's no time that you can give up for God that in the end you won't be better for it. Anything that you can do for God and give up for God, He said, I will return to you in this lifetime a hundredfold. So Jesus was the better for it 
resisting the temptation of the devil, coming out ready to do the work that God is sending to do. And it says like this, he said, There went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And verse 15 said, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18 says like this. And I want you to listen to what this says. Because we're going to go to Isaiah 61 in just a minute. And hopefully we'll understand this prophecy and everything that it means. Jesus began to read and he ran. I want you to understand, Orthodox Jews, they don't do like uh, Brother Chad and, and I do. They don't go and they don't pray and they don't ask God, well, what would you have me to say? They have an order to the things that they do. And on that particular Sabbath, it was that particular time to read that particular uh, passage from Isaiah. It wasn't that they sat at home, Brother Mark, and said, what should I preach about this Sunday? It was already written. They went in order of the, of the Pentateuch. They read it in order. So at that exact time, in that exact place, in the exact way that it should have been done, Jesus came and read this exact passage. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Any other time, any other place, any other person could not read that and mean it. Except for Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is the Son of the living God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Savior sent down. He is our kinsman redeemer. He is the one that became, the Bible says that He who knew no sin became sin for us and took on Himself a form of flesh that but in the flesh, through the flesh, might destroy the works of the devil. And I'm glad to know that Jesus done that right there. And we'll go over to Isaiah 61. And I want you to see where uh, there's, a, there's a separation in this prophecy you got to understand, and the reason there's a separation because this prophecy is two parts. This first part, Jesus came and fulfilled in the day that He appeared preaching in, in Galilee. This part, He fulfilled everything that God had required Him to do. But this next part has not yet come to pass. And you'll say, well, Brother Daniel, are there anything that needs to come to pass? There's a lot of things that need to come to pass before the end will come. There's a lot of things that have to occur before this, this time that we're living in, the time of the Gentiles, will be called to an end. And it says, and Isaiah 61 verse 1 says like this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to pr proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where it stops in the book of Luke. That's where Jesus purposely stopped in the book of Luke. Because the rest of this is what God is getting ready to deal with you and I about. Listen. There's a lot of people in this world that think that things are just going to go on like they are. They think that we're just going to, the sun's just going to keep coming up and keep going down and it's never going to change and we're always going to be in the same situation that we are. But there's going to come a day, the Bible says, when God will stand up and say, that's enough. He's going to call an end to time and He's going to send back His Son to bring those who have trusted in Him and this is the part that Jesus purposely let out. It says, And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. The Bible teaches me, the Bible says, that Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Somebody smites you on your cheek, the Bible says, Turn to him the other cheek also. Why? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We have one who is on our side, 
There's a record being written up in heaven for everything that's done. The Bible says whether it's good or whether it's evil, it'll all be brought up on the day of judgment and God will be just and He will be the judge of all in that day. Listen, we, wanna, we, we like to, in this day and time that we live in, we, the, we almost preach a watered-down doctrine where we say, come to Jesus and everything will be alright. You'll never have a problem. You'll never have a care. Everything will be roses. Everything that you do will prosper. Listen, we live in a real world where there's real trouble and there's real trials and there's real tribulations and there's real sickness and there's real times when we have real troubles and we have a real God that understands all those things. We have a real God who took upon Himself the form of a man and suffered the things that we suffer in this day and time. Well, He don't know what I'm going through, Brother Daniel. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews like that, where we had not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So He's able to take whatever you're going through, whatever it might be, and understand, and He's able to secure you. And what does that mean, Brother Daniel, to secure? He is able to take everything, bind it all up, and make sure that nothing is lost that, that is important to lose. Listen, I want you to understand the day of vengeance will come. All those who have set themselves against God, listen, those that have shaken their fists toward God, those who have denied that there is even a God, they, the Bible says that on that day, the great white throne judgment, the Bible says that they will be separated, the sheep from the goat, the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left hand, and the Bible says, and He'll say all to all those that are on the left hand, depart from me, I never knew you. But those that are on the right hand, those that are the sheep, those are the precious of God. He said, enter in to the reward of your Lord. You've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. The reason Jesus didn't say that the day He came to that synagogue in the book of Luke and He read exactly in order what things were to come to pass was that time had not come yet. We are going into Passover. I know everybody likes to call it Easter. But listen, that's all right. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our Passover. We don't have to go and get a lamb. We don't have to go through all the rituals that they have to go through in, the, in that day that Jesus lived in. And they still do that today. It says like this. It says, uh, in the day of the vengeance of God to comfort all that mourn. And verse 3 says, to appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Listen. There's nothing wrong with being concerned with this life. But Jesus said to not worry about it. For there's nothing you can do by worrying about it. I seen an atheist say the other day, he said, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of people saying, ask God to do this and ask God to do that. And this guy, listen, I want you to know what he's saying. I, I sort of agree with it. I don't agree with the fact that we shouldn't ask God and we shouldn't seek God's face. But listen, there's so many times that we cop out of what we are called to do by saying, I will pray for you. Jesus said at one point, when somebody comes to you that is hungry and is in need and you say, go and be you fed and be you clothed and you don't give them the things that they need. You have done no good for that person. This man who does not believe in God said a true statement by saying, instead of keep asking God to do something, ask God and then go and put your hand to the plow and you start plowing. You start doing because you are the hands of God. You are the feet of God. You are the mouthpiece of God. You are the eyes and the ears of God. God works through you to accomplish His purpose in this world. I want you to understand that there's none of us perfect. No, not one. Not even Brother Lee. I, I mean, I know that's a shock and that's a surprise, but there's none perfect. No, not one. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all turned uh, aside. We have all left off following what God would have us to do. 
And that's why I could say this, that I do not stand in my righteousness. I stand in the righteousness which is in Christ Jesus. He has given me life. He has given me the ability to go in and to come out. He has given me the ability to say, I am a child of the King. He has done all these things for us. And I have put my trust in Him. He is my Passover. He is the one that in my place died so I might have life and have it more abundantly. It says in verse 4, And they shall build the old wastes. They shall rise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dresser. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. God knows how to secure you and I. Jesus said, why worry if you cannot add to your stature one cubit? Or you cannot make one hair uh, gray or one hair black? Now listen, by worrying, not, so, not by a bottle. It didn't say that. About by worrying can you do these things. It does no good. Take everything to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. Don't do anything until you have took it to God in prayer. You wouldn't go out in the field without your tools, would you? You wouldn't go to work without your equipment to work with, would you? Well, why do we think that we can do the things of God without even consulting God, without even calling on God, without even asking God if this is what God would have us to do? We first have to be equipped. There are so many people. We were talking in Sunday school this morning. They, they call this nation a Christian nation. But I want you to know, the nation that we live in today was founded on Christian principles, founded on the Word of God, that our laws were governed or were patterned after the laws of God. The way we run our country originally was after the Scriptures. This is not a Christian nation. This is a far cry from a Christian nation. There's coming a day that God will set everything straight and make everything right. And Christ will reign, the Bible says, from Jerusalem. And the Bible says that all the world will come up to Jerusalem once a year and they will worship in that city. That's going to be the thousand years that's going to occur. And I want you to know that He will make everything right. What makes you a Christian, Brother Daniel? Your relationship with Jesus Christ. You mean coming to Elkhorn Community Church Sunday and Wednesday night doesn't make me a Christian. Not any more that I go to Pipeful Medical Hospital makes me a brain surgeon. And I can go five days a week and that still won't make me a brain surgeon. Being in the building does not make you a Christian. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, makes you a Christian. Makes you of the way, the Bible says. We'd be in trouble, Brother Lee, if that's what uh, qualifications for brain surgery would be is, uh, well, that fella over there, he's here every day. Let's let him get a crack at it. No. And the world looks at us and despises us because we're not shining the light. We're not a city set on a hill. We're hiding our light under a bushel. Well, you're not talking about me, am I? You must be talking about somebody else, am I? Surely that, that, that pertains to the person behind me or beside of me or in front of me. Does it? Only you and God know where you stand with God. If you're doing everything that you can do to stand, the Bible says stand. I think it's Ephesians like this, having done all to stand, stand having the whole armor of God on. Does it matter what I think? Not really. If it don't match up with what we will say of the Word of God, it matters little. Does it matter what uh, Mike Sloan thinks? If it don't match up with the Word of God, it's very little. But if we're in line with the Word of God, it matters. And we must speak the truth in love. And we must be what God would have us to be. Now that goes for me as well as anybody else. 
A lot of people think that the preacher gets up and he's above reproach. A lot of times the preacher's back in the back on his knees trying to make sure that he is above reproach. That when he does stand in the pulpit, that he can stand not in his own righteousness, but the righteousness that's in Christ. That he can be able to deliver a message that is without fault before God, not before man. Listen, I'm less than nothing. I'm not the best preacher ever was, nor will I ever be the best I ever will be. But I want to be the preacher that preaches what saith the Word of God. I want to be the preacher that says what the Word of God says. When you come to me and you say, well, what do you think, Brother Daniel? Hopefully I can tell you what the Word of God says. It's our whole counsel. Go back to Luke chapter 4 just for a moment. It says in verse 19, it says, To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Before then, to have a relationship with God, you had to convert, convert to Judaism. You had to go through all that they required you to go through. And that was just to get into the part of the temple where it's called the Gentile part, where only the Gentiles were allowed to go. Jesus Christ came that he brought down the middle wall partition. He tore the veil in twain. The Bible says that when he died, the veil of the temple rent in twain. What was the veil separating the, the holy of holies from the most holy place? Why is that, Brother Daniel? So we can have access to God. That's where Hebrews says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace and make our petitions known. Verse 20 says, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And I want you to listen to what it says here. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. 400 years they had not heard from God. 400 years they had went about their business just like routine, brother. They had went in and they had done their sacrifices. They had celebrated their festivals. They had made their oaths. They had done all these things. But they had never had an open word from God until they was an old ratty looking preacher and camel's hair ate locust and wild honey. Brother, I, I, I'd hate to say this, but we, we, we would, might not let him preach in our pulpits today if he come to us the way he came to them. John the Baptist, the Bible says, was full of the Holy Spirit before he was even born. The Bible says that when Mary came into the presence of Elizabeth, who was John's mother, the Bible says that the child inside of her led with joy. 400 years of silence. Here comes John the Baptist. What did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, coming out of the wilderness, full of the Spirit, goes to the synagogue, reads Isaiah 61, goes out and preaches. What does he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Daniel Ratliff, over 2,000 years ago, accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior October the 12th, 1997. Stands before you, what is today? March the 30th, 2014. What did I come preaching to you? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts. If you will hear his voice, call upon him, give your life to him, repent of your sin, that you might have life and have it everlasting. And listen, everything else God will take care of if you'll give it to Him. He will work it out with you if you'll give it to Him. Pettiness, not liking this one, not liking that one, having trouble with this one, having trouble with that one. Listen, that all needs to melt away in the presence of a holy God because we are His children and we, He loves us and we ought to love one another. No two greater commandments did God give us when Jesus said these two commandments are what the whole law and the prophet is hung upon. One, you shall love the Lord God, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen. 
Somebody ask you what they need to, need to know or need to do to be a Christian? Tell them what John the Baptist told them. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Tell them what Jesus said. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Tell them what Chad Wells has said. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. My old daddy, he said, I don't want much. He said, when I go to heaven, he said, I'll, if, if I can just sweep the streets, he said, I'll be satisfied. I remember when I was a little boy, he came preaching. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, what about this religion and that religion and all these different denominations? Listen, all that needs to melt away in the sight of a holy God. Listen, just because I don't worship just exactly somebody else might worship. Listen, Jesus Christ is the binding tie that ties us all together. And unless we have Him as our Lord and Savior, everything else that we do, the songs that we sing, the, the ties that we take up, the tenets that we have, all is worth nothing in the sight of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you saying I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'll tell you something. I remember I was five years old when my mom and dad got saved. I was five years old and went down behind the old schoolhouse and watched them get baptized. I can see that just like it's happening right now, Sister Pam. I can see that and don't wonder what in the world were they doing. Grew up under all the preaching that I heard all that time. And I want you to know that it wasn't all that great, great, great stuff as when I heard that still small voice speaking to me. Well, you heard an audible voice? I heard the Lord speak to my heart. And the only way I can explain it to you is you know when God talks to you. You know there's no, there's no formula for it. When God says this is your time, today is the day of salvation, harden not your heart, come to Him. All those messages I heard, I could have saved myself a whole lot of trouble, but I just repented because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Well, ask Kristen if she'll come and get us a song of invitation. Uh, Kenny and Lee, come up with her. We'll turn the heat off. Now they, now they drown me out. That's fine. That's all right. There's nobody that can tell you about your relationship with God. There's nobody. You can come and talk to me. You can come and talk to Chad. You can come You can talk to one another. But there's nobody that can tell you about your relationship with God but you and God. Today, if your relationship with God is not what you think it ought to be, pray. If your relationship with God doesn't exist, pray. If your relationship with God needs to be stronger, pray. The key is pray. Talk to Him. Don't talk to Him like He's in a distant place where He can barely hear you. Talk to Him knowing that He is right here today in the midst. The Bible says, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, He said, there will I be in the midst. And brother, I know there's more than two or three gathered today in His name, in this place. Pray. Have you thought of what God would have you to do? I can do very little. So could the widow. She put one mighty in. She done it so nobody could see her. Jesus said she done more than all of them that uh, had come and made their big fancy uh, parades and things like that and set in their great wealth. A little might, little widow come in, stuck a little might in the plate. The Bible says Jesus was sitting over beside the treasury watching how people came and offered. And he saw the little widow Working her way up. That little mighty. Jesus said she'd give more. Because she gave out of her want. She gave all that she had. She didn't give of her excess. 
She didn't just give because she had it left over to give. She gave because she had nothing else to give. She gave all she had. Have you ever heard of being sold out to Jesus? I don't know. I don't know if I can trust Him to take care of me. Can't you? We move. We, we move about. We breathe. We, we exist because He allows us to. Every breath that I take is because He has allowed it to come. You don't have to be sick to die. You don't have to be old to die. It just has to be your time, and God knows that. Are we sold out to Him? Listen, think about this time, Passover. Think of it like this. Am I totally sold out to Jesus Christ? If they come to me tomorrow and say, well, now, if you ever say anything about Jesus anymore, we're going to take your house, we're going to take your, home, your cars, your, your bank account, all your pension, everything like that. How many people would run for the hills? Oh, I won't say nothing else about him. I won't say nothing else about him. Or will you be like Peter when they took him into the synagogue and they whooped him and they told him, don't you preach in this man's name anymore. Jesus, uh, Peter said like this, whether it's right in your sight, whether we ought to be, obey God rather than man, rather than man, you you judge. But we're going to obey God. We're going to preach Jesus. We're going to lift His name up. Whatever comes. Those big, big, big words, Brother Daniel. Do you have the grit to back it up? I don't. I don't, not nary a bit. I don't, but I know who does. And I'm trusting in Him. And I know that He will keep me whatever may come. He's brought me so far. I don't think He's going to leave me. Leave me off right here. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Good, good poem that they come out with years ago. Talking about the footprints in the sand. Talk about the Lord walking beside of you and all of a sudden he started going through all these troubles and trials and you only seen one set of footprints. But come down to it, the Lord let them know that when those times come, I picked you up and I carried you through. I know he's in this place and I know he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you're able to think or even imagine. If you'll only call on his name. He loves you. He loves you. Loves you with an everlasting love. Listen. I, I love the Lord. I don't know what else to tell you. I love the Lord because he first loved me. I was so mean. I was so hateful. I gave my mom and my dad and my sister such a hard time. When they, my sister come to know Jesus when she was 12 years old. I, I loved her. I always, I've always loved her. I walked out in the rain to watch her get baptized. But I, I, I said to myself, ain't no way in this world I'll, I'll do that. I said, Missy's just tender hearted. She just followed along with mom and daddy. So, so that's all it was to it. They had trouble in the church that I used to go to. And I, I used that. And I said, if that's what it's all about, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Knowing better. But that's not what it's all about. People. People can't get along. People can't get along. Moses took care of million, two million of them. And he about went crazy. Listen. That's not what it's all about. It's your relationship between you and Jesus Christ. When you stand before him on that day, you ain't going to be saying, well, well, Brother Daniel. But Brother Daniel... He's going to be like, no, you, me and you. What's our relationship like? Do you know? That's what counts this morning. I bless you is my prayer. Hopefully by next Sunday we'll, well, we don't even know what we'll have next Sunday. It might be 80 degrees out there and we'll need air conditioning. If that's the case, we'll go up and then we'll have a service out in the parking lot. Yo. No fellowship tonight just because of this. It's, we don't have the light, and I don't know how much of the kitchen is 
affected by the lights being off and and no it huh no choir practice today just because of this but next Sunday is the first Sunday and we're going to have to start getting everything tied down and and ready to go go ahead We didn't get the bulls today. Joey, is that the ninth or is it the sixteenth? Ninth as of right now, we have not changed it, so. Okay. <laughs> 